This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we're talking with August Shell Brewing Company. I'm Tim Dennis, and with me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Brian Hewitt. Hey, Tim. Joining us today, we have Jace Marty, the brewmaster for August Shell Brewing Company, and Kyle Marty, the VP of Operations for that same brewing company. We're going to talk about the 160th anniversary of August Shell, the family's six generations at the helm, their new pilot system, Star Keller, Bill, Star Keller beers, hard to say that sometimes, uh, and a lot more. Guys, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. I don't think Brian's had nearly as much to drink yet <laughs> as, it, as it may sound like he has. Just give us time, though. I, I made the mistake of taking a good sip right before I read my stuff. It was just a little too much liquid going just on. Just too mouth. much. Yeah, just just too a much. little too much saliva and beer. Yeah, it happens. Absolutely. You know, guys, we were talking just before we came on the air here a little bit about uh, Oktoberfest. And uh, you mentioned you're trying to do some stuff, but staying in accordance with Minnesota's regulations right now. I think you mentioned you have some limitations on occupancy in that is that correct yeah so it's it's it'll have to be a reservation only event uh no walk-ups or anything like that 250 people max unfortunately they have to remain at their table and remain seated if not if they're walking to like the bathroom uh masked up and things like that servers have to wear masks and uh, they have to serve everything so it'll be a pretty tamed down event uh, in years past but sometimes it's just having an occasion for people to get together uh is is half the battle anyway are they going to get special chicken dance masks like chicken face type <laughs> they, of thing? no yeah. dancing actually uh, it, the second they stand up we have to tell them to sit back down again oh <laughs> well, that's this is like <laughs> being in kindergarten yeah. or something yeah, get back to your desk no. it's okay. like whack-a-mole at the brewery yes mm-hmm. yeah i guess you do what you got to do that's you know we've famously here in georgia been in the news about you know it's just open season in here, but most businesses are being a little more responsible than our government. And uh, like we went out this weekend, we went to a, a popular brewery here, Halfway Crooks, but very limited seating. You had yep. to wait. You had to be walked to your table. You had to sit down there. They had no touch, ordering, payment, everything. You know, so you scan a QR code, you order your beers on there, you get your food there. And if you move, like you said, you move from your table, you put your mask on and, and then you file out of there. So that's yeah. one of the more intense ones. You do all your yeah. ordering on the phone. You don't even talk to them. They bring it to, they'll bring it, it to you and then just w- walk off. You Put know? your table number in. They come <laughs> through. Right. You know, which is really not a bad deal. You know, they just no, no, drop it's really not. There. It's efficient. So. Whatever allows them to be operating and allows yeah. us to drink beer and hang out on the patio. I think make it, it happen, okay right? It. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at too. Is it's just we just want to let people get out there and kind of be normal again. So. Yeah, just do what you can. It's like, hey, okay, everything stinks right now. We're going to make the best of it that we can, right? <laughs> now, Brian, I've been dipping into some more fest beers this year, uh, this season, other than the the ones we did. We did our, our blind tasting yes. recently, tasted a bunch of those. Have you got into any other any other fest beers, Oktoberfest, Martzens? Oddly, I really haven't. I, okay. I, I Usually, I really get into it. I think it's something about not going and doing the, the very festive things. It sure. has me not... Yeah. I really, most of them I've had either on our visit to Halfway Crooks or I've had it here in the studio. So yeah, I, I noticed this lack. I need to, I need to make up for that. I need to uh, get into my, get my fest on Tim. You know, one thing that was nice after we did our blind taste and we posted things on the shows, we had a few breweries that either emailed us or mentioned on and said, Hey, FYI, ours will be out this weekend. Or yeah. So we know, we know where to go to get the rest of them. Do they have so, our address? <laughs> that's right. Stop on by there. Yeah. Now, uh, you guys are at Shells. Well, do you do Fest Beer or Martzen? We do an Oktoberfest. Um, okay. I would say it's uh, more the Americanized, kind of the, the hybrid Vienna lager style. And I, I, I listened to your guys' podcast, the, the, the tasting of the Oktoberfest. Oh, okay. And cool. uh, I saw you had uh, Tucker Brewing Company. Is it Tuck, Tucktoberfest? Tucktoberfest. Yes. Yeah. Sure did. So, yeah. Um, their head brewer actually interned at Shells. Uh, oh, his name, okay. Yeah, his name is also Tucker. It's Tucker. It is. You know yeah. what? <laughs> I, I think now that you mentioned that, I remember him mentioning when we talked to him. 
that yeah. he, that and it has nothing to do there. with the brewery. It's just a weird, Absolutely like, nothing. cosmic yeah. co- uh, collision of things. There. Yeah. yeah. They're so doing he, good stuff. Yeah. He uh, spent a couple months up here. We had a, I had a great time with him hanging out, took him to a bunch of beer festivals uh, in Minnesota here. And uh, yeah. Yeah. He's that's awesome. Good guy. I hope he's awesome. doing good things down there. You know, they're one of the breweries here that's focusing on the lagers, you know, yeah. German style lagers and that. And we've got Halfway Crooks that we went to. They do a lot of lagers. We had Arches Brewing in Hapeville, Georgia, down near the Atlanta airport. So it's kind of crazy to think that we've got three, at least three, breweries now that really focus on lagers. It's all coming back. That's awesome. That's right. Lagers. And Shells was like, we've been doing this for 160 <laughs> years, y'all. So, so welcome yeah. back. We've yeah. been waiting. Hey. Yeah. So, Tim, I think it's time we get into the beers of the week. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Woo-hoo! Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, as always, we got a good sampling of beers to uh, to get into this week. We unfortunately don't have any Shells beers, but we've got some others that, as we talk here, we'll get through. One uh, from a previous interview we did, Brian, Off Color Brewing. We yes. have Sparkles Find Some Trouble, which is a Leipzig-style Goza with hibiscus in it. Now, one thing about that Leipzig-style Goza, it's not as intense as a lot of these American, you know, Gozas or Berliners. Not that, a, that'll knock your teeth a out. A sodium so, bomb. Yeah, the salt, salt and sour. We also have... Uh, from Contrast Artisanals here, a brewery here in Chambly, Georgia, Brownie McBourbon Face. I love uh, the name. <laughs> yeah, Brownie McBourbon Face, which is a bourbon barrel aged oatmeal brown ale. And uh, one all the way from Japan, we have Hitachino XH, which is a Belgian brown ale, aged in shochu. I, I hope I'm saying that I at think least that's right. close to it, right, which is a distilled sake. So we're going to get into that. Something, which is intriguing. Something crazy yeah. there. Absolutely. Well, Brian, what's happening this week in the news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so in possibly the biggest news of the week, we've learned from Brewbound that Molson Coors and Yingling have formed a joint venture, the purpose of it being to expand Yingling's distribution beyond the 22 states they currently have and into the western half of the country, basically. I had no idea they weren't already out west. I just see them everywhere either. here. Yeah, they're yeah. so huge. I just thought they were kind of yeah, everywhere now. They're so yeah. big, and that's really a, a giant opportunity for them. So it sounds like Yingling is stepping away from being a craft brewery, but they stress that the uh, Yingling itself will remain a family-owned business and that this new partnership will operate as a completely separate entity. Uh, so this deal goes beyond just distribution. The plan is for uh, some of Yingling's beers to also be brewed at Molson Coors facilities as part of the joint venture. So I, I imagine they've been working on this deal for quite a while, and I have to wonder if this had any effect on the splitting of ways between Paps Brewing and Molson Coors, like maybe Who clearing knows, them man. out of the way to make, make room for Yingling. You know, they seem to get a little creative with definitions of a craft brewery. Like oh, yeah. For the big boys. It's, it's like, you know what? They're, yeah, we've got rules, but they're in pencil. We'll, a, we'll adjust it if we need That's to. a whole other business. That's a they have yeah. whole other yeah, LLC. That's, that's you know, it's it's not us. It's yeah. not us. Yeah. So here's some interesting stuff here. Boston Beer Company is getting into the non-alcoholic beer game, and they're doing it with a Sam Adams non-alcoholic hazy IPA called Just the Haze. And uh, you can expect to start seeing that sometime in early 2021. Apparently, they've been thinking about doing this for a while, and there's not a lot of details, but they've just announced it. So hazy, non-alcoholic, Tim. Here at Beer Guys Radio, Brian, we were early adopters of the non-alcoholic. We were. So we we decided, you know what, we saw this trend coming. We've We've played around with them and tried several. Uh, Athletic Brewing is one of our sponsors, yep. uh, one of our favorite non-alcoholic brewers. And we're actually next week, we're going to have Bravis Brewing on, another non-alcoholic, another big player in the game. So uh, there's de- even for people who drink regular alcoholic beer, uh, there are times, you know, when when it's appropriate. So it'll be fun to see where it goes. What do you have against alcohol, Tim? I have nothing against it. It's <laughs> one of my best friends. That's we right. hang out quite often. Mine actually. too. Every yeah. now and then you have to, uh, you know, take a break. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, So as you probably heard, the West Coast is going through a really rough time on top of the pandemic. There are wildfires. They're forcing people out of their homes, shutting down businesses and wineries, breweries, even hop farms. But if there's a single good piece of news about it all, it's that a man in Vacaville, California, saved his home with beer. The man's name is Chad Little. And when he saw the fire approaching his home, which was still under construction after he lost it in a fire five years ago, he decided he wasn't leaving. So he realized that water had been turned off. He grabbed the only other liquid he had on hand, cans of Bud Light, and he uh, beat back the fire by shaking up the cans, puncturing them with a nail, and spraying Bud Light on the fire. And that was just enough 
to keep it away until the fire department arrived. To take care of business. Yep. Bud Light saves the day. Bud Light Brian. saved the day. Yes. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys radio show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon with August Shell Brew. Have you ever thought about owning your own brewery but don't know what it takes to get one built? We're Storytime Construction, and we build breweries. We're Georgia's most experienced and hands-on contractors when it comes to building new breweries and tap rooms or expanding existing breweries. We offer full build-outs, remodeling, and additions, as well as consulting and construction management. Give us a call at 770-733-4343. Storytime Construction. We build breweries. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember, all episodes are available on demand, so if you miss the broadcast, get the podcast. Beer Guys Radio is available on all popular and unpopular podcasting apps. It's available on apps we've never even heard of before, Tim. We're on a new app this yeah, that's now, right. Brian, that just launched. Amazon Music just added podcasts. So if you miss the broadcast, get the podcast on Amazon Music. Can't do that. Yeah. Now let's get back to August Shell Brewing Company. Uh, guys, thanks again for joining us. We do appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to chatting with you. Some beer history there. You guys know a lot of beer history, I would say, correct? <laughs> Yeah, we have a little bit. Yeah, got a little bit going there, touch. right? <laughs> you know, speaking of that, again, something we d we discovered, you know, kind of setting up for the show here. Uh, we kind of have a common friend and a gentleman named Dow Scoggins. I think Dow is in Ohio now, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, Dow was one of the owners of the Friends Brewing Company in Helen, Georgia. Back was that eighties? Is is that right? Mid nineties, maybe. Uh, eighty eight, I think, is when he when he launched. Oh, yeah. yeah, into the early nineties. But you you helped them out with one of their beers there, one of their actually really popular ones, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a big part of our business, kind of in you know early craft days, as we were a contract brewer. So we had a lot of connections throughout the United States. That's pretty cool. So they brewed their Hellenbach beer. One yeah, that they did. And Brian, a couple years ago, we actually got with Max Loggers here in Atlanta. They redid that. For a, that's right uh, they did a race a, Hel a helen back race and they redid the helen Bach beer so we got to all the original owners of friends brewing company which is no longer open unfortunately but uh, they came back to atlanta to brew that so that was really cool that was a lot of fun and you mentioned that dow was actually during that time was hitting you up to get that old recipe yeah, uh, yeah. right to get that going <laughs> again so very cool very cool well now august shell brewing company you are the is it the second oldest brewery, family owned brewery in the United States? Is that right? That is that correct. Is correct. Yeah. And that sixth generation of Marty's have, uh, have worked for the brewery, done the brewery. So 160 years this year. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yep. 160 years. That's something. So crazy. Just the history there. Like we said, you know, we've got, uh, we've got breweries here in their mid twenties. Uh, but it's cool. I like hearing the history of everything. It's insane how much has changed in that many generations. And like, you just think about what we've got sure. in the most recent generation. What's a generation like thirty years on average? I mean, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it, we, there was no internet thirty years ago, or was there a beginning? No, no, not even, not really, even anything. Not there. at that yeah, time. Crazy. No. Like There's how much some... can change? So, uh, so it's it's impressive that uh, you, that it's it's lasted so long. Did you guys ever think about possibly doing anything else, or was it always like? We're definitely getting into the family business. For me, I mean, it's just kind of, we grew up in it and uh, it never was anything that was kind of forced on us, but it was always something, at least for me, that I, I knew I always wanted to come back to. I mean, we, it, I left for college and, it, you know, I always come back during the summer and work in the bottle house uh, and packaging, washing kegs. And uh, as soon as I graduated, I was, uh, I was working at the brewery the next day. Because as we've seen, like historically, they've done studies where uh, the children, except as you move on generationally, it's more likely that they break out of the family business. Correct. Yeah. Helps, uh, breweries help, yeah. <laughs> you know, make I was it, make say, it a, little, a, little, a little better business yeah. there, right? You're making Absolutely. widgets and post-it notes that maybe be a little different. But. 
<laughs> right. The family, the 160 year old, the historical widget business. The, uh, the only other the place where that happens is maybe like in music or acting and politics. So, like, you, people yeah, get the, the family there. dynasties like, that way because it's kind of cool, but everything else, I'm like, hey, I make paper clips. I'm like, no, see you, dad. I'm doing something else. <laughs> right. You make beer, on the other hand. Oh, I'm, I'll I'm hang sticking around. around. I'm hanging around. Hang around. At that point. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking about hanging around, you know, 160 years and that, we don't talk to a lot of breweries that have survived prohibition here in the United States. And, uh, you got had to get a little creative there. So what did shells do during prohibition to, to keep the doors open? So, uh, yeah, we had a, uh, a local route that we, we supplied with. And obviously when they, they, uh, shut the door on alcohol, uh, we had a couple of different routes that we could take. We could, you know, mothball the brewery, which that didn't turn out very well for a lot of people, or we could go to textile production of some kind, but we decided to go with the near beer production. Uh, so we sold near beer for the duration uh, we also sold pop and candy uh just pretty much anything we could we could do to, to scrape by yeah got to keep the that's you know we talked about the atlantic brewing company here in atlanta that was around many many years i think till the 60s if i remember correctly but they they were an ice company you know delivered ice and that so just do what you can so you know in, in the past you you did the uh, the non-alcoholic beers and they're kind of on the the rise again people are very health conscious and uh, just calorie conscious and all that. D do you sell any uh, uh, non-alcoholic? And have you thought about reviving any of that just for now, you know, health conscious consumers in instead of prohibition purposes? Well, we do a couple things. We, we make a 1919 root beer, uh, which is a, an actual prohibition recipe. Um, that's something we've been making for quite a long time. Uh, we also make a, some craft sodas or, or buddies soda. Um, but we have in the past a couple times now, uh, we've actually rebrewed one of our prohibition recipes. It was a non-alcoholic beer called Vacuum Tonic, which was a it was an interesting beer that it was marketed for the sick and convalescent as well as nursing oh, yeah. mothers. Right, <laughs> ah, um, tonic. Okay. Very, very strange demographic, but uh, it was <laughs> when we brewed it, and it ends up being like a six and a half percent alcohol beer. It's almost like an American Bach beer. Um, you know, kind of, you know, it's a very old school recipe with, you know, they use like black malt, caramel malt, and then just Pilsner malt, you know, it was very, they didn't have all the different variations like we do now. Um, but it's a really interesting beer we, that was obviously we've made it full alcohol. Um, didn't in prohibition, we had a, a method where we boil off the alcohol. We'd send it back into the okay, kettle after right. fermented. Um, so we haven't done the actual non-alcoholic version. It's something I've been dabbling a little bit in the lab, uh, our lab as well with, um, playing around with some different bacteria that only will ferment glucose. So it's definitely something we've been dabbling in. Uh, haven't stepped it up into a full uh, release yet. But it, It's cool the way you guys do a non-alcoholic beer. They're like, yeah, this is our non-alcoholic beer. It's only 6.5%. That's it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great for pregnant for women. Wait, that's right. yeah. It's cold Nobody up here in Minnesota. That's, you gotta, that's, that's yeah. how you get yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You got to stay warm. 6.5%. <laughs> that's non-alcoholic for Minnesota. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't recall the specific details, but I think it was Heineken that was saying they'd found a particular yeast that per, that would ferment but would not actually produce much in the way of ethanol. And they, I think that they... Their 0, 0.0 might have been a use of that yeast to accomplish that. And I'm not 100% sure that's true, but somebody was experimenting with a, I think they found the yeast in the Amazon rainforest of all things. For sure. There's a strain that uh, is marketed through one of the major suppliers that they, they was originally marketed as a pre-fermenter because it produces these crazy esters and aromas, um, but basically produces no alcohol. It only ferments glucose and very small amounts of it, but the amount of aroma that it gives off is just intense. So. Uh, we were using it in our sour program a couple times, and now they've kind of rebranded it towards non-alcoholic beer production. So we've obviously been experimenting with with that as well. So. Interesting stuff. Now you mentioned that you kind of brought back your prohibition beer, uh, but albeit with alcohol there, the non-alcoholic version. Do you have any other recipes from the the, the days of yore? That's my new saying, Brian. The days of <laughs> days yore, of yore. Uh, that you brew now. Uh, our Shell's Deer brand would be kind of our flagship American lager, and that was first brewed in 1912. That was our first foray into the American lager style where you used a corn adjunct. Um, everything prior to that would have been an all malt beer, 100% uh, six row. So our deer brand, yeah, that's, that's still the recipe from 1912. Well, that's right. Six row. That was back when six row was the, yeah. the one to go with there. huh? It, and that's the, the oldest beer that you, you still brew basically at this point? Or yeah. You, okay. Yep. And that was, that's always been our flagship. You know, that's pretty much pre-craft everybody made an american lager and that was our that was our beer you had a uh, pre-prohibition lager i saw on your website and i was curious 
what makes what's the difference between a pro pre prohibition lager and a post prohibition lager? I guess is what you would call it. Uh, well, that would be our deer brand, the, the pre prohibition lager. Um, oh, was that the deer brand? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's you know it's pretty simple. Seventy uh, percent six row barley, thirty percent corn, or you know, and there's different variations. You can use flake corn, corn syrup, uh, corn grits. Yeah, you do a cereal mash. Uh, we we did back then. Um, you you use German hops for your bittering, um, or sorry, American hops for your bittering because they were usually a uh, cluster or some other you know hop variety that's not very pleasant. Uh, and then you saved your yeah. your nice German imports for your your aroma hop. That's not, you know it's fun exploring those old styles like that. Yeah, We've seriously. tried a few. We had the uh, the one from Chicago, the temperate that temperance brewed for the uh, uh, from the world's the world exposition. Yeah, yeah. There. Uh, we had Nihao, the ancient Chinese. That's beer right, the that, Nihao. that they found the recipe on. Like so. a grad student with a Monday night got together yeah. to make that ancient Chinese. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. It's interesting. Yeah, it's fun to see cool. those. Cool. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon with more from August Shell Brewing Company. You know we love good beer, and Athletic Brewing makes non-alcoholic beer that stands shoulder to shoulder with their boozy brethren. With a fraction of the calories and certified organic, it's a great beer to enjoy anytime. Athletic's got new brews like Cerveza Atletica just in time for summer. Check out the full selection at athleticbrewing.com. Use code BG25 for 25% off your first order, and U.S. customers get free nationwide shipping. Athletic Brewing, brew without compromise. It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram roger roger what's our back there victor now back to the beer guys radio show welcome back to the beer guys radio show i want to give a quick shout out to one of our great radio affiliates klid 14:30 a.m in poplar bluff missouri catch beer guys radio on klid every saturday at 4 p.m local time now let's get back to august shell brewing company uh, Kyle, Jace, we want to talk to you some about the August Shell property. Is it? Do you call it the estate? How do you refer to the entire complex there? Well, I guess I would just call it the brewery grounds. The brewery grounds, okay. Because yep. there's a you do actually have a lot more going on there than the brewery, though. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we've got the uh, the brewery itself, and then we've got uh, the old Shell boarding house where the workers used to uh, to stay during the week. Um, that it's been retrofitted into an office. Uh, we have the old carriage house and stable that has been retrofitted into the museum uh, slash visitor center. And then we've got the Shell Mansion on the, on the ground where August Shell built his home in 1885. That's pretty awesome. So I have to ask, which of you guys is living in the mansion right now? <laughs> <laughs> so the bylaws of the, of the company are that only the standing president can live there. But uh, I don't think anyone has any intention of living there because imagine sitting around in your underwear watching football and people are appearing in the windows. On a, yeah, on a Sunday, I get so. that all the time. That's their fault for getting so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so not a whole lot of app- not a whole lot of appetite for that. Yeah, my grandmother was actually the last one that lived there in 2002, okay. and she used to freeze in the winter time because the heat used to be hooked up to the boiler here at the brewery. So on the weekends okay. they weren't using the boiler, so they would put it on super low, and then the heat would just shut off at the house. And she was an Ouch. old German, so too stubborn to say anything, so she would just freeze all just all cold. weekend wow. until they come in on Sunday night. <laughs> See, now the flip side of that down here in the south, I thought my my air conditioner went out in the middle of summer here. And we had a couple days there where I'm like 92, 93 degrees in the house. And I'm thinking, you know, air conditioner was only invented in the early 20th century. How did these people survive this? I have no idea. And there was so much more physical labor back then, too. You know, you'd work the fields, 100 degrees, doesn't matter. Get out there, work. You the, work I in, would die, man. I would die. You work until you pass completely out. I think that their grandmother was the original Wim Hof with all of the sitting around in the cold and just yeah. not being bothered by it. It's impressive. <laughs> I see you also have 
quote, historic ice caves on the property. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you still use the caves? Uh, we do. We actually, okay. um, when did we start that, Kyle? Probably five, six years ago. Uh, yeah. We cleaned them up and uh, started our barrel aging program in the caves again. Um, so kind of bringing them back to their original uses. Uh, there, a lot of them have been filled in over the years because they were underneath the brewery and, and we were worried about the structural stability of the buildings. But there's still two sections of the caves yet that we fill uh, with bourbon barrels and we do a, a barrel aged beer over the summertime uh, where it stays naturally cool and we release it uh, in November. I wonder how many places still do that because I've, I've heard of these things, but I haven't seen. I, have we talked to anybody that actually still uses caves? Fun fact, Atlantic Brewing Company, the caves that they have. Yeah is now a parking garage i believe at the atlanta hill oh so really that is okay where, that's the old side of the atlantic brewing company's uh cave so. that's pretty cool so can visitors get a a flight of beer and then go spelunking in your caves or are they <laughs> are they kind of you know held off so you can just age things in there they're not very tourist friendly they're they're pretty low and uh yeah so no we don't really let that many people down there fly to beer spelunking go by <laughs> the mansion and see them in their underwear that's right. <laughs> just roll this around this is an adventure really i'm excited here, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a party to me. Yeah. Now you're also your uh, your property there is on the National Register of Historic Sites. Uh, does that present challenges to you at the brewery? Uh, no. So it really hasn't in the past. Um, I mean, it, where it would get into some issues is if we would start taking grants to like keep the the buildings up. Like there's always been talk. You know, the mansion it needs its upkeep built in 1885, so it, it sure. has its issues. Yeah. So if we would ever take public grants, you would have to open it to the public. But I think we tried that once and some uh, artifacts ended up missing so we've just kind of kept uh, that closed off okay. to the public and just kind of self-fund any any uh projects that need fixing there now you mentioned like the, the artifacts and that how one thing i've heard a lot even like looking here most of my historic beer knowledge revolves around georgia's breweries but even some of the old breweries here a lot of them didn't keep records that well so how much documentation do you have recipes and all of that from from the early days of your brewery? Uh, kind of the early 1900s is when they when we have more detailed recipes. The okay. stuff from the 1800s is pretty pretty sparse. Um, it's more financial bookkeeping type records. But right. yeah, we do have recipes kind of starting in the, in the early 1900s. Okay. You get back there far enough, and I think paper and ink might have been a little bit more of a luxury than they are now. We Absolutely. You know, throw it away all the time. You know? And, yeah. and to, you probably had these brewers that the, the recipe was probably in their head. Especially, sure. you know, the first generation, you know, Germans and that they're like, I just know how to make the beer. It's yeah. like, why write it down? Like, if I write it down, somebody could steal my recipe and, <laughs> yeah. you know, go brew it. You know, I know exactly. what I'm doing. Yeah, I don't right. need to write all this stuff down. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you're only making one beer. It's not like you're, you know, today yeah. when you had 50 different recipes, it was the same right. recipe. <laughs> that is a good point. You know, at one point in time, KFC only made the one chicken, you know, they, they spread out. So you keep that secret. You don't want anybody knowing. The, the Coca -Cola traditional Coca-Cola. You know? 1860s hazy IPA. That's right. That's, that's yeah. what it was back then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The secret was oats. <laughs> yes, yeah. So many oats there. So you have also, and I thought this was really interesting, I saw a news story about it, a, a population of deer that like live on the property, but don't just live there. They're kind of maintained, and are they, they're in an enclosure? Yeah, so um, the, the, the kind of deer has always been an emblem here at the brewery, and when August Schell came over and started the brewery, um, his father was actually a forester by trade in Germany. Uh, so he, that, that came with him, and... and there's always been a deer park here at the brewery with, with uh, a herd of deer here. So, yeah, we've got, oh, I think we've got four deer right now, a buck and two does. And then every year we, we kind of try to, to swap them out to, to promote health within the herd. And, yeah, so it's, it's just kind of another part of the, the park. And then on top of that, we've got a couple peacocks rolling around here at the grounds as well. So just <laughs> it's like a. The menagerie, it's the shell menagerie. Kind of a yeah. nature preserve. I was trying to think of why you would want to do that, but I guess I kind of get it. You know, you could walk around, see the wild animals, enjoy some good beers. No, I get it. I get it. I can you see should, why you do that. You should teach those deer to pull a beer cart and run them, yeah. run, run around with them like uh, <laughs> like your own personal Clydesdales there. Yeah. We do still have a, we have a beer wagon yet that we uh, we do take out for parades. And See? One of the things, unfortunately, with, uh, with COVID is we were going to do beer deliveries with the actual wagon this summer, but that kind of uh, got shut down. Yeah. So. So many great plans got squashed yeah, due to this, exactly. this pandemic. Now, Jace, you're also involved uh, in distilling. Is that correct? Uh, working on it. Yeah. Um, working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll be opening a distillery here, uh, also in New Ulm. Um, still, still fundraising at this point, but um, 
me and a, a good high school friend who grows barley for us at the brewery uh, kind of spun off a little side project from there. So okay. uh, the whole thing is based on Northern Terroir. Minnesota grows all the ingredients that you need for, for distilling. So uh, whiskey, rye, oh. bourbon. That sounds good. See, that's we just, yeah. we just had a, a conversation uh, last week. Uh, you know, we talked with uh, Tommy Arthur from uh, – uh, from I can't the Lost Abbey, Lost, Abbey. Lost Abbey. We were talking yeah. about Toir in brewing. And it's just you know it's really something you don't hear much about outside of wine yet. You're hearing more, but uh, you know the terroir of your of your distilled spirits and that. What are you planning on uh, distilling there when you get going? Um, primarily whiskeys. Uh, you know my background with running the sour beer program here is a lot of mixed culture fermentation. So I want to incorporate a lot of that into um, the spirits that we'll be making um, and also kind of while the the whiskeys are aging i want to do a lot of rum um specifically kind of the funkier jamaican style rum which is definitely like those crazy mixed culture high acid fermentations so that'll be a big part of it um but then also uh you know with our whole thing being northern to our based and molasses obviously not growing uh sugarcane not growing anywhere near minnesota right, i'm gonna okay. make belgian candy syrup as our base um kind okay. of taking that brewing element into things so yeah been making a ton of belgian candy syrup at home on the kitchen and uh experimenting with that yeah that was that sounds like that sounds quite a feat there <laughs> seriously yeah yeah i i was really intrigued by the idea of of distilling mixed mixed culture fermentations i didn't know that was a thing i didn't either now yeah. i'm excited by that i yeah. i saw that doing the uh, the research for this i'm like well we got to ask about that yeah. for sure so yeah, yeah. check it out we've, yeah we'll have we've all open top wooden fermenters um kind of custom built three times as wide as they are tall to promote ester production um really you know focusing on the fermentation aspect of things um yeah it, it's going to do a lot cool. of things differently i think it'll That's be pretty cool awesome well you're listening to the beer guys radio show we do need to take another break but we'll be back very soon with more from august shell brewing Company. It's time to take your snack back with bold flavors that complement your latest brew. Southern Recipe Small Batch Pork Rinds will do just that with flavors like Korean Kimchi Barbecue, Honey Chipotle, Cilantro Lime, and more. Munch on these beer-friendly bacon bites right out of the bag or crush them in your favorite recipes as a substitute for breading. Find your next bag at Kroger or go to southernrecipesmallbatch.com for recipes and a buy two, get one coupon. That's southernrecipesmallbatch.com. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing, establishing a new standard in craft beer. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons get cool perks like Beer Guys swag and commercial-free episodes. Now let's get back to August Shell Brewing Company. Guys, we want to talk to you some about your sour program and your uh, Star Keller series of beers can you can you tell us a little bit about that what is star keller star keller is our sour facility um we launched a, a whole line of sour beers uh, coming up on 10 years ago everything that we make is mixed culture fermentation based on the berliner weiss style uh, i studied i went to brewing school in berlin and that was kind of a pet project of mine when i came back was to start a uh, berliner weiss program um but everything is aged in our original cypress wood lagering tanks that are from 1936 they were installed wow. right after Prohibition. We used them for almost 60 years. Uh, and then they, we retired them. They sat empty for another 20 years and um, went through a very long, painstaking process to restore them. And we've been making sour beers in them ever since. Um, That's pretty awesome. Which is, you know, for us as an old brewery and, you know, craft being very much, you know, what's new and uh, modern, it's a way for us to, to 
kind of keep up, not necessarily keep up, but like still still thrive and, and adapt to a new market. We're an old brewery and, and our history we think is important and what sets us apart. And so to be able to take that piece of our history and do something completely new with it, um, and I think very, you know, very relevant to the current times with this, you know, mixed culture sour program, uh, I think really helps us stay relevant in, in the in the craft beer world. Yeah, and it's cool kind of bridging the two. You've got the, sure. the newer style and the older tanks. Now, I imagine as old as they are now, maybe not so much, but did the Cypress tanks, was there a reason that Cypress was chosen? And did they did they offer anything additional to the beer? Absolutely. We were making lager beers with them and, you know, lager beers are clean and crisp and you don't want a lot of wood flavor. So Cypress is very neutral um, okay, from a flavor standpoint. Yeah. So that yeah. was specifically chosen. They were also uh, wax line. That was something the brewers would do uh, every month or so would re- reline them with wax. And, uh, you know, obviously now 80 some years old, uh, they really don't impart much flavor at all. Um, sure. yeah. We have some beers now that have aged for three years in them. And I definitely get like a dryness that comes from from being in the wood, but uh, you know, it's I don't think it's any discernible uh, wood character that comes from it's, it's cool. definitely the, the you know the micro oxidation that you get from the you know the big upright fooders. All right, yeah. Now, do you um, let's see the question? It's escaped me, Brian. It's right there. I had something. Well, I I have poignant to, to say. I I'm I forgot to look it up, but does Star Keller translate to anything? Is it is it? So the the first beer that we released was called Star of the North, and we've kind of okay. gone off of this star space theme ever since. But then Keller is German for cellar, so star cellar. Okay, uh, it's kind of yeah. kind of where the name came from. Uh, I had a feeling like it meant something, and I was wondering like, well, it looks like killer, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's that's intent or if there's something else going on there. Okay, no, star, star, star killer. Naming beers is the worst part of making them, so you got to oh, get really yeah. creative because everything clever you've ever thought of, somebody else thought of it already. It wasn't that hard 160 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Right now, they're yeah. So now, do you um, the, ten years ago starting Berliners? I mean, that was kind of an early adopter to to the sour beer game, right? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> this is super nerdy, but. We were the 42nd Berliner Weiss on Beer Advocate. I remember okay. specifically. Really? All right. And there that included go. all the German ones. There was like a handful of U.S. ones. And yeah, it's funny. We, you know, I tried to be very historically accurate and make these traditional examples. And now, uh, you know, that style is completely morphed with the, you know, the advent of kettle souring um, that they're, you know, they're unrecognizable as Berliner Weisses, even though that's the actual, actually yeah. what they tasted like. I'm wondering how hard it would be to explain what the beer was to people like, uh, you know, 10 years ago or eight years ago, whenever you were first making the, the first Berliners, like, oh, this is sour. I think it's off. Like, no, no, no. It's supposed to oh, be like right. that. It's yeah. supposed yeah. to be a little tart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a lot of hand selling. Definitely. You know, this, sure. <laughs> here's a three and a half percent alcohol beer that is sour. <laughs> and it's also a you know, aged for a whole year. You know, you see that even now, you know, you're talking about 10 years ago, Brian, but even now, if you get someone that just knows like Bud Miller Coors type of beers and they try a sour beer, it's many times it's not a positive response. And we talked to, uh, you know, we talked to Shelton, Dan Shelton about Cantillon when it came to the States. And he told the same story of, he had a lot of people calling him and saying, this beer is bad. He's like, no, it's not. That beer is phenomenal. That's your, you're wrong. This is, it's, that's what it's supposed to be. So mm-hmm. you, you do have the benefit with the Berliners is you've got the uh, the mitt shoes. You can add have the little bit of syrup in it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have you yeah. experienced. Was it Waldmeister? Was that Waldme- one of them? Waldmeister, yeah. Waldmeister. Yeah, yeah. Waldmeister. Yep. Uh, you guys Would do you any of that? We not really. I mean, we've had them from time to time just in, in our tap room um, just to offer it. But for the most part, you know, we, we strive for complexity, um, you know, with them being mixed culture fermentation and a long secondary with Britannomyces. I think they have a lot of character. Um, and we also, you know, try and design them with a very balanced acidity that it's not just enamel ripping sourness. You know, there's, it's the soft rounded sourness. It's not just, there you, go. you know, pure acid that you need the, the shoes. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to cut it with the, with the sugar syrup, right? That's yeah. right. To balance it out. Now, are all your beers like a mixed culture Berliner style? Do you go into anything like, you know, any Flanders or the, like the goose style or Lambics or anything? So everything... You know, this was kind of our bigger philosophy of what we try to do at Shells is, you know, our, our German heritage and our history is what sets us apart. And so how do we focus on that, you know, from a brewing standpoint and be creative just within that little box? And so when we started the sour program, like, all right, we're only going to make German sours and specifically Berliner Weiss, but let's see how we can push the push the style in different directions. So we actually have made like a Flanders red, but it is a 
you know, started off with all the Berliner Weiss cultures that we have that I it brought back from Germany, um, made it in the Berliner Weiss production method, you know, single decoction, no boil, um, you know, mixed culture, primary ferment, but then, you know, with a Flanders red malt bill. And you get this really interesting kind of mix of both worlds where it's not you don't get the acetic bite of, of like a Flanders red. You get the more of the lactic sourness of a Berliner, but you still get that, you know, pie cherry character from yeah, that's the Flanders malt that bill. So good. you can, you can really end up in some different areas that are, that are kind of cool, uh, you know, in between spots between the classic styles that I think, you know, at least for me, I think is, is pretty interesting. That does sound good to me. I, I would be all over that. You know, I, we're running short on time, but we, we do have to touch on that new pilot system you have. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that's it's you know it's kind of falls in line with this too. Is um, you know we we have a bigger system. We it's a hundred barrel brew house, and so for us to again to compete in in the you know the modern craft times, we need to be a little more agile. And so we installed a fifteen hectoliter uh, German brew house that matches mirrors our our big system. We can do decoctions and um, it's a, the multi vessel system. Um, and it's again like we can really experiment now we're going to be opening a tap room on site we just have the outdoor beer garden right now but we're going to over the winter time we're going to renovate our, our visitor center to include a tap room where we can have these more experimental styles on on tap and uh, but still very much focusing you know starting in the roots our own you know german heritage and seeing where we can push you know almost specifically loggers uh this the system came with um eight horizontal lagering tanks 15 hectoliter horizontals which again, are one-tenth the size of our main ones. Um, and so I think lager beers, you know, it's definitely uh, kind of the the new trendy beer style, which is also, you know, I think the, the, the pendulum swinging back in craft beer. And so, all right, let's 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 be creative and continue to be creative and push the bounds of lager beer. That's it, man. Don't call it a comeback. They've been here for years, <laughs> That's right. right? Yeah. That's what we enjoy. It. Like we said, you know, it's, it's nice sometimes. Uh, we go to some of these lager breweries and, you know, we're always asked these questions about, what notes do you get in this? What do you taste here? You know, this and that. Man, sometimes I want a nice crisp Pilsner where I can just drink it and talk to my friends. And and that's it. You know, I don't want to I don't want to overthink my beer. I just I just want to drink and beer and hang out. You but know, have a good time with it. Incredibly versatile too, you know. We've sure seen a are. lot of experimentation with loggers locally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have a good time with it. Absolutely. I have to ask before we go, what is a square old barrel? I saw it referenced on some square. of your <laughs> your beers and I'm like, what on earth is that? Is that Cypress too? <laughs> no. So it's a barrel cooper in Minnesota who actually helped uh it's him and his daughter. Uh they started Black Swan Cooperage in Park Rapids, Minnesota, but they helped restore our cypress wood tanks and they have since started this company where it's if you can picture a square half barrel keg uh, okay. with, with four okay. flat sides and then there's three wooden staves in each of the sides that you can swap out i've seen these so no, it's like a have you? It. yeah yeah so, so you can fill a regular yeah. beer in it and it'll oak age inside of like a, a regular half barrel it's really you cool can swap out your staves exactly yep. yeah now that you mentioned it i do i do recall seeing those somewhere Mm-hmm. I need to look into this. Yeah, I, I have to I've, check it. It's yeah, kind of, it's really cool. With this I, at all. I, you know, I think it may have been Jr. at Max Lagers. We were talking about it, or or some brewer was looking into them there. So it was a pretty cool thing to check out. So. Yeah, they're super cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Kyle, Jace, thank you so very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So, if people want to find out where to get what the latest is with August Shell Brewing Company, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, so you can go to any of our social media sites, uh, Shells Brewery or Shells Beer, excuse me. Otherwise, uh, www.shellsbrewery.com. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Join us next week as we dive more into non-alcoholic brews with Bravis Brewing, like we mentioned, Brian. We are Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. <laughs>